dying to improve our account of the death of the Audit Commission. We got onto wider questions about the role of standard setters, inspectors, regulators and other bodies, all charged one way or another with improving public services and the controversies that surround them. We noted that certainly in the field of health and social care, but also elsewhere, there's a distinct tendency for to come and go. And someone said, well, look at Ofsted. Highly regarded, these days it's not even controversial. It's like that is a clear-cut, resounding success. Unfortunately, a little bit of innate caution kicked in, because, of course, since then, there's been all the controversy around the so-called Trojan Horse Birmingham schools, and a pretty public punch-up between the Chief Inspector and the late departed Michael Gove about the accountability of free schools. So you kind of think there's an element of cyclicality to some of this. It goes around, it goes around. Um, your independent arms-length regulators are set up by ministers, always with the declared intention that they will be independent. They're created in a wave of optimism that they will prevent bad things happening, that in one way or another they will contribute to improvement, and then something goes wrong. Birmingham schools, Somerset floods, mid-staffs, baby pee, Winterbourne view... Well, they have to report to the ministers, the very ministers who are ultimately responsible in Parliament for the service these regulators or inspectors are looking at, uh, when things go, don't go well at a broader level. And then the watchdogs themselves find that they are barked at and questioned. Uh, so, and sometimes, you know, sometimes by the public, sometimes by those they inspect, and sometimes by the successors to the ministers who set them up in the first place. You know, for the more classically minded of you, quis custodia ipsus custodes. And, of course, the days are long gone when the inspector or regulator was the sole guardian and generator of the data on which judgments are formed, something that pretty much was the case when the Audit Commission set out in the 1980s. These days, in all sorts of fields, vastly more routine data is published and increasingly required to be published, regardless of whether we're talking about schools or GPs or hospitals or universities or council services. Now, these may or may not have produced the government's hoped-for armchair auditors, but it has strengthened the hand of academics' interest in these areas. And on top of that, there is just simply vastly more user-generated content, sometimes a bewildering array of it. In the field of health, for example, from blogs to IWantGreatCare.com, to assorted families and friends tests, and to officially moderated sites like Anisha's Choices. So in this session, we aim to address four questions in the particular context of the Care Quality Commission, but also thinking slightly more broadly, if we can, about the broader lessons from that. And the questions are, in a sense, in this changing environment, how should it operate? How should CPC and others operate? Uh, how can it and other regulators maintain trust when things go wrong in the services for which they're responsible for inspecting or regulating? What is the proper relationship between regulators and ministers? And how can they remain independent but still be held accountable for their performance? And how should quality regulators in health and other sectors use new information and technologies to assist Joyce and spot failures and maintain trust, which is a pretty broad set of questions. To discuss and perhaps answer them, we have an impressive set of speakers, plus, of course, an even more impressive audience, which is you. We'll open with David Behan, Chief Executive of the Care Quality Commission, and he, of course, has also seen these questions addressed from another viewpoint as Director General for Social Care in the Department of Health. And the aim is he'll speak for no more than 20 minutes, and I will try to hold him to that, and I will try to hold the other speakers to 10. He'll be followed by Stephen Dorrell, who frankly needs no introduction as a former Secretary of State for Health and until recently Chairman of the Commons Health Select Committee. And last but not least, we have Sonia Soda, Head of Public Services and Consumer Rights at which someone, you might say, who takes the consumer perspective in all of this. So we hope to have no more than 40 minutes of presentation, then some 40 minutes or so of discussion, and after which there'll be a drink outside. So, David, do get going. Thanks, Nick. Well, good afternoon, everybody, and thanks very much for um, sparing your time to help us with, um, with this presentation. Um, Nick's going to keep me to time, um, so he'll give me a two-minute warning, and then I'll just race through the rest of it. But um, um, my argument this afternoon is uh, quite simply that um, for regulation to drive improvements in quality in health and care, the regulator needs to be independent, accountable, and trusted. And we know this because this is what people who use services tell us they want from services. We have a responsibility to uh, make these fair, consistent and robust judgments of quality. And I think we've all got responsibility to use these judgments to drive improvements. And I'll say more about this. And I don't think we can drive improvements without being independent, accountable and trusted in the way that we operate. 
but these are complicated and complex uh, issues that are relevant to other regulators, not just to uh, CQC. And what we want to do is spark a debate about these issues, and it's great to have uh, a range of people here to help us to do that. But I want to say something first about quality. The debate in healthcare about quality has really been uh, live since 1966 with Don Obedian's uh, uh, work on quality. Ara Darcy in High Court Care for Hall gave us a much more contemporary definition. And in CQC, we are using a definition uh, that embraces safety, effectiveness, caring, responsiveness, and the leadership and culture that exist. Quality is not a simple concept, it's, co it's complex. I believe that there are five influences on quality. What commissioners do, what providers do, what registered professionals do, what regulators do, and how the voice of people that use services influences quality. But what we're going to do today is focus on improving quality through regulation. And I want to um, take some time to open up a discussion about the nature, tone and style of regulation and what's important both to the system and to members of the public that use the system. We're going through unprecedented change and as we go through this change we need to keep focused on the goal of why we're here. Uh, it is my view that we need to be a regulator that we can be proud of collectively and that has the trust of both the public and is effective in meeting its purpose. Uh, and we do that to ensure uh, that health and care services provide people with care which is safe, compassionate, high quality. Uh, and we do that so services uh, we can be encouraged to improve. Jeremy Hunt said recently that um, will give CQC a statutory independence uh, so that the well, uh, because the welfare of patients is just too important for political meddling. And our new legislation, he meant the CARE Act, which has now been given royal assent, will make sure that ministers uh, put patients first. So it's independence with a purpose uh, that I want to discuss and why trust is an important and integral uh, element of building trust, uh, building uh, that independence. But I want to touch uh, first on uh, why do we need um, quality regulators at all? Well, I think um, there are three main functions that we've got as a regulator. Firstly, and I think the state has got a long history of this, going back to uh, the time when states were created, and that's to protect its citizens. And I want to argue that um, the modern form of the state protecting its citizens is finding form through regulation. Uh, it's manifested itself in protecting people from violence, from exploitation, from just and unfortunate events. But latterly, it's around uh, ensuring people get access to services uh, that are of a high quality. Regulation is now a mechanism through which protection can be given. Uh, in this regard, I think uh, health uh, and care is a bit of a special case. Uh, there's three elements to this. Firstly, uh, healthcare is not a perfect market, and I would argue in some areas it's not a market at all. It's not like buying a TV or a car. Secondly, there's a great power asymmetry between those providing care and those receiving care. Uh, the power is distributed very differentially. And thirdly, uh, there are very real consequences when healthcare goes wrong. If I buy a Duff television or a Duff car, I've bought a Duff television or a Duff car. Uh, for some of the issues that go wrong in health and care, it can be degrading to the people receiving it. It can be undignified, and indeed, in some cases, people uh, can die. Third element of our role is to have a systems overview. I think CQC is uniquely placed looking at the health and care service, being able to spot trends, outliers, patterns, to build a view from the bottom up and to take a, a view about the effectiveness of that service and to speak with uh, courage when we see things which are unacceptable. And then the third element is really about information asymmetry. I think we've got a role in opening up what we've referred to as a secret garden of medical and social care knowledge to the public. Uh, we now have a role in holding up a mirror to the whole spectrum of quality so that people can get a good sense of what that means. It's also important uh, that we uh, take to heart our role of encouraging improvement. Um, 
when we do these three things, we do this for the purpose of encouraging improvement. We're not an improvement agency. We aren't responsible for improving services. But I believe we are an agent of improvement, and our role is to enable improvement to take, uh, to take place. So what makes CQC unique as a regulator? Well, we have some unique powers to register, inspect and enforce rules. We have comprehensive coverage of health and care. We uh, deliver impartial judgments, which no one else in the system is in a position uh, to judge because they've got different incentives uh, in the way that they operate. I think we've got a unique role in setting uh, an expectation of what good looks like. Uh, and although we have some unique powers, we're not alone. We work with the health and safety executive and the police, who also have strong powers. We'll work alongside the Nuffield, other think tanks like the Healthcare Foundation. We'll work with organisations like WITCH, uh, Dr Fosters, and indeed I've got colleagues in the room from both the professional regulators and uh, in David from Monitor, an important colleague in the way we work with them on some very real issues. So the challenge for regulators is in complementing rather than competing with others in this space by focusing on what we uniquely do and doing it really well uh, and working alongside others. So what do we need to do in order to effectively protect people from harm and provide this overview uh, and reduce this uh, information asymmetry? Well, we need to build trust, uh, credibility and ultimately respect for what we do. We need to be trusted by the people uh, that we regulate, the people who use services, policy makers, uh, MPs, uh, ministers, uh, and critically by the public. And this is hard. It's probably the greatest challenge that we in CQC face, and when I lie awake at night, the greatest challenge that I worry about getting right. And it's even harder when we're doing that in a climate of declining trust in public bodies where paradoxically being more open and transparent may expose weaknesses which further expose uh, and erode trust. So we need to have a track record of delivering uh, in order to be trusted. Uh, we're turning ourselves upside down in order to develop a new approach to what we do, aligning our motivations uh, with the, those of the people who use services so we can really say we are on their side. Uh, we should want what people who use services want, good quality care. As well as a track record, we need to be known. Uh, people need to know that we exist and what we stand for. Walk down a street and ask people if they've heard of Ofsted, and the majority will say yes. Ask if they know who the Care Quality Commission is, and less than one in ten would say yes. Over time, we need to change that. Underpinning this track record and awareness, however, there are two essential things, uh, independence and accountability. So understanding uh, our technical underpinning is important and each regulator is surprisingly different in this respect. Who has the power to appoint, who can tell you what to do, uh, how to do it, uh, who do you report back to each year? Who pays your salary? There's, there's huge scope for difference in these questions, and all British regulators uh, have difference across the sectors. For CQC, the legal underpinnings are already in place. Uh, we have a clearly defined purpose in law, but we do need to consider the implications of our funding model. We're funded by granting aid from the Department of Health as well as from fees. Uh, as a public body uh, with uh, statutory powers, uh, government ministers appoint the chair. Uh, the power of um, uh, appointment is important, as was demonstrated recently in Nick's introduction around Ofsted. Obviously, we've got a great chair in David Pryor and um, uh, a great appointment. But with a new Care Act, there's tales of skip tipped in favour of independence. Uh, we have this technical independence. Uh, we're technically accountable. But I think our relationships of accountability go much more, uh, much go more broadly uh, than this. I think we've got one slide too many. Yeah, I want this one. So there's a web of relationships that illustrate the complexity of our independence and accountability, and we need to hold these in the right balance. We should be held accountable for the scope of our activity and the way decisions are made. 
but the judgments should be ours and ours alone. I want to use an analogy now, and you can choose your sport, any which has a referee. Personally, I played football. Uh, people that have been helping me with this wanted to use rugby, so I'll stick with a rugby one. I think we're the referee on the pitch. We enforce the rules and hold to account those who break the rules. We're not the active players, we're not the spectators in the stand, and we're not the coach in the dugout. How we enforce the rules and encourage players to play changes the game. We are impartial experts and we'll be held to account for our judgment. So let's just do a bit more on uh, this web. In the orange, we've got the formal independent accountable relationships. We're formally independent um, from Parliament ministers and the department, and yet we're accountable to DH for our budget, dependent on ministers for appointment, and held to account by the Health Select Committee to Parliament in their capacity as the democratic representatives. And the blue dotted line is a relationship with people in the system who have a role, but not in providing services, NH England, Public Health England, Health Education England, monitor um, the professional regulators, the trade bodies, we're independent of these bodies, uh, we're not accountable to them, but we want to be collaborative and responsive with them. In green, we have the relationships where we are formally independent, yet we want to be accountable. Perhaps a term we should be using is morally accountable. We want providers, we regulate, and the people who use services to hold us to account. We want to listen, to be responsive, to be relevant and trusted being on the side of people who use services and being accountable to, to them uh, requires us to think about care from their perspective. We need to be open and humble, speaking directly to people in any case where we got it wrong. Ultimately, the answer to who is regulating the regulators is you, members of the public, and we should be wise never to forget that. In all of these relationships, independence and accountability need to be demonstrated. And we need to do this, let me just go back a slide, through our words and through our actions. What we say, um, well obviously we need to speak the truth about what we find, um, the truth as best we know it. We need to develop an authoritative voice through commentary on issues that matter in a tone that is challenging yet constructive and not full of jargon. We do need to speak truth to power and talk about the both the good and the bad of services so that our view is not distorted. And when we are speaking on behalf of people who use health and care services, we must work hard to ensure that we do so fairly, impartially and truthfully. The audience matters too. We should speak to the public, to the system and to the providers. We need to understand more than ever how people want to engage with the sort of information we provide and perhaps uh, be happy for someone else to do the final mile, whether that be Dr Foster's, NHS Choices, or Net Mums. But our words alone are not enough. Our words need to be backed up by our actions. We should do the right thing through registration of services, enforcement of fundamental standards, applying ratings and conducting our inspections. We should be independent in the judgments that we make about what we find. We should be listening and responsive without being swayed by providers, politicians, governments or lobby groups. We need to have the courage to act on what we find. I think there is a reluctance to identify poor care, perhaps out of a concern for the damage to staff morale or the confidence of the public. But I think that's just ignoring an inconvenient truth. Care is not uniformly good. What we are finding is a huge amount of variation in the quality of care. And if you ignore care uh, failings in care quality, you can never expect quality to improve. CQC has an important role in shining a light on poor care and speaking out where there may be cultural denial. So coming to the end, our purpose is to make sure that health and care services provide people with safe, compassionate, high quality care and encourage services to improve. We do this by protecting people, having a whole systems overview, reducing the information asymmetry in the system and thereby encouraging improvements in quality. To do this effectively requires trust and the right balance between independence and accountability. 
independence from the system will enable us to build trust and perform our role and perform the role that only the regulator can carry out. What this means for CQC is that we need to change our approach to inspection, to the way that we monitor services and do that intelligently. We need to involve experts by experience and clinical experts in our inspections. We need to work hard to develop our track record and build trust in the organisation that we are becoming. I want CQC's voice to be independent and authoritative, informed, fair and credible with both our partners and with the public. So if we do our bit, will you do yours? It's our responsibility to provide good judgments on the quality of care and it's, our responsibility, it's your responsibility to use them. It's a responsibility of providers to use our judgments to help them improve the quality of their services and the first step of improvement is to acknowledge that uh, improvement is required and the CQC judgment will help in this. It's a responsibility of system leaders to use our judgments to take action in areas where care is just simply not good enough, but also to celebrate where there is good care and celebrate even more where there's outstanding care and where others can learn from that care. It's the responsibility of the media and politicians to take our judgments in context and to appreciate the complexity which is, in the, uh, is quality in healthcare while highlighting failure and challenging the system to improve. And then lastly, and I speak to you as consumers of health and care, it's your responsibility as a savvy consumer to make informed decisions about what is best for you, to use our judgments to help you make better choices for the care for yourselves, your families and your loved ones. Our argument this afternoon has been that for regulation to encourage improvements in the quality in health and care, the regulator needs to be independent, accountable and trusted. This is what people who use services and their families uh, want us to be. Thanks very much for listening. Great, David. Bang on and just under time. Stephen, wherever you feel comfortable. Standard. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you very much for the invitation to come and talk about uh, regulation and to listen uh, to what David has just said. I think most of us in the room would recognise that since David took over as Chief Executive of the CQC, he's made a huge difference uh, to the organisation, to the, the uh, service that it performs, the, uh, the way it goes about its work, and it is beginning to address the issues of trust and public confidence uh, that were very sadly lacking in the CQC uh, that, it, that uh, you inherited, David. So I begin by paying tribute to you for the steps that you've taken to set CQC on the right path. But uh, since you invited me to come and offer some thoughts, uh, I'm not going to be entirely uh, unprovocative, or I shall try to avoid at least being entirely unprovocative. And I want to dwell in what I say on two conflicts that seem to me to be present in public policy, which haven't yet been fully thought through and fully resolved. Um, the first is to invite you to think back 25 years to 1989. In 1989, there were no commissioners in the healthcare system, and there were no system regulators in the healthcare system. There were, of course, regulators. There were professional regulators. Uh, it's a great mistake to imagine that there's a new insight come into health policy over the last 25 years, and that before 25 years ago, nobody was concerned about quality. That's, uh, that's clearly nonsense. Uh, but over the last 25 years, we have developed two bureaucracies, one devoted to commissioning, the other devoted to standards inspection and regulation, both focused on health care, health and care provision, without, I would suggest, having fully thought through how those two systems are supposed to relate to each other. And the simplest way of illustrating that is to just reflect on what happens in the Secretary of State's private office at six o'clock in the evening when somebody rings to say there's a great crisis in the, Bar in the Barsetshire General Hospital. Does he ring the hospital itself? 
Does he ring uh, the commissioner that is paying for the service on behalf of the taxpayer? Commissioner's probably gone home by six o'clock, so probably not the best place to start. Or does he ring the uh, CQC to say, why has this guy got a ticket to practice? Or does he ring the professional regulator? Where in the system does this responsibility lie uh, for the, the commitment all of us would want to see out of the health and care system? First, to throw, to, to, to insist that these services are accountable in public for the standards they deliver as well as the value they deliver. Sunlight is the best disinfectant. So where does the responsibility less lie for that? And secondly, having thrown the spotlight or the sunlight uh, onto the service, whose job is it to do something about it? Now, uh, instinctively, I would, uh, I, I would start with the proposition that whether you're talking about health care or making baked beans, it doesn't matter. You never inspect quality into a service. Inspection is what you do to test whether you're delivering your aspirations and to catch the laggards. Inspection is not how you develop a, a, a coherent system, whether you're talking of service or manufacturing, for delivering quality. So the purpose of a regulator ought to be, should it not, to insist on, as David quite rightly says, access to information so we know what's going on, and clarity about what's acceptable and what is not acceptable. And if that were clear in the mind of policymakers, if it were clear in the minds of policymakers, we'd have some chance of making it clear in the eyes of the rest of us. Uh, if it were clear in the eyes of policymakers, it would also follow more naturally then that it would become clearer what is the role of the commissioner. I speak as somebody who is a strong advocate of effective commissioning in health and care to use the information provided by the regulators to test the delivery of service and to drive quality forward by, uh, uh, by the, the use of public money, by the use of the competitive process, that C word that we're supposed to use only with care, uh, in order to ensure that all the time we're looking for a better way of delivering the objective that we set out. But if it were true that the system is built on the basic proposition that the regulator is there to identify what goes on and to define the minimum that is acceptable, and the commissioner is there to build on that, to push the system forward, why is it then that in the structure we have now, the NHS England, as the commissioner, is the body responsible for patient safety? Don't get that. National Patient Safety Agency set up in the, after some previous uh, scandal uh, was set up to ensure that the, the basic minimum information about patient safety was collected and applied and used. That ought, in my view, as I've said regularly from the select committee chair, to rest naturally with the regulator that defines the minimum standard. But the policymakers who are supposed to be clear about these things have worked out uh, that, national, uh, that, that patient safety is the responsibility of the commissioner, while regulation is responsibility, uh, regulators are responsible for defining minimum standards. So I use it as an example, and there are plenty of others in the system, to underline the importance I attach to thinking through, if we're going to pay for a regulator and we're going to pay for commissioners, where, are the va where is the value added that we seek to get out of these different, system, different bits of our commissioning regulatory system? And how do we test whether they actually do it? It's one thing to hold healthcare regulators, healthcare deliverers, providers uh, to account and to test the value they provide. Sometimes, sometime, one day, we'll have to get around to testing the value we deliver through the regulatory commissioning structures that we've established as well, and step one of that, I would suggest, would be significantly greater clarity about what role we actually expect the different bits of this structure to deliver. That was the first point I wanted to draw out this evening. The second point is, is to take on, if I may, David, one of the, the, the phrases you use regularly in your address and just test it. 
which is you regularly use this word system, and it worries me. Our health and care system. We've all done it. I've done it myself. I've probably done it this evening uh, to talk about the health and care system. The first thing we know about the delivery of health and care in the, U in the UK is that whatever else it is, it isn't a system. So maybe just in terms of avoiding the abuse of language, we should stop calling it a system. But more importantly, actually, is the regulator part of the system? Or should it consciously set itself apart from the system? Are you, instead of being part of health and the health and care system, should you not be a regulator of a sector. And if you thought about yourselves as a regulator of a sector, would that not immediately encourage you also to do something which, this is not a criticism of you, because you haven't, as I've already said, you've moved, the system, you've moved your structure a long way. But how can it be that we form a view that is worth listening to about the quality of health and care delivered in England without looking across and comparing what we do in England, well, revolutionary with Scotland and Wales, maybe even with France and Germany and the United States. If you're a dementia patient living in Manchester, your requirement, your recognition of what a good service looks like is exactly the same as the person with the same clinical condition that lives in Cincinnati or lives in Munich. And does our system know how the people who rely on... I've, I've made the, mis the mistake, I used the word. Do we know within our health and care uh, sector how our standards compare with standards for similar patients in similar sectors elsewhere in the world? If the CQC were genuinely independent, it wouldn't be part of the system, it would be testing the system, and it would be using evidence of what it could be like as, uh, to, to test what it is like. Final thought, and then I'll uh, move on. I've probably run out of time. Uh, independence and accountability. David, in your thoughts, you recognise there's, uh, there's, there's a conflict inherent in those two words. If you're completely independent, to whom are you accountable? As I was reflecting on what you were saying, I think it's worth recognizing this is not a new conundrum. Uh, one of the regulatory structures we've inherited from Henry II is the system of law courts applying justice on behalf of the king, as was. Now, Law courts are independent. They've built up over many centuries a reputation for independence. And they are also accountable in the sense that they, any, if you get any collection of judges together, they will tell you they have to find ways of responding to public opinion. So this is not a completely new conundrum. That's the point I want to under, underline. That yes, there has to be... I was flattered that you uh, thought that... Uh, House of Commons Select Committee had a role in this formal accountability. I agree with you on behalf of my colleagues still sitting there. Uh, I agree with the formal accountability, but ultimately you're 100% right. This I unreservedly agree with you. In the 21st century, the age of Google, the age of, the, of big data, information is what makes everybody accountable in a way that was undreamt of in the days of Henry II. And if you can develop information that compares what happens to our patients with what happens to patients with the same clinical conditions all over the world, then you've created real accountability. Fantastic. Great. Well, loads of food for thought there. Thank you. Um, uh, so again, just to echo thanks for inviting Witch to come along to contribute to the debate. 
Um, I thought it would be worth, first of all, saying uh, a bit about which and our interest in public services. So we are the UK Consumer Association. We're a charity that represents the interests of all consumers. And our mission is really to make people as powerful as the organisations that they face in their everyday lives. And we take that mission as seriously um, in relation to public services as we do in private markets. And we've got a long-term um, ambition to be as powerful an advocate in this space. Um, and our work in uh, health and care sort of spans three uh, areas. First of all, we undertake research and insight to understand how people are experiencing services on the ground. In particular, our magazine will run investigations. For example, we sent actors to live in care homes. Uh, we've mystery shopped GP consultations. We also do kind of traditional policy and campaigning work. And then thirdly, we also provide free information and advice to people making decisions about public services. We've got a website called Which Elderly Care? Uh, which does what it says on the tin, and a, a website called Which Birth Choices, which helps expectant parents choose uh, where to give birth. Um, and really what I want to do is reflect on the role of uh, quality regulators in this very kind of messy system uh, that Stephen uh, alluded to, and their role in ho uh, holding public services accountable for the quality of what they deliver, particularly in light of the variants, the big variants that we um, all know um, exist. Um, and I think, you know, Stephen summed up extremely well the changes that we've seen in public services and just quite how messy the system is in terms of different lines of responsibility, lots of different actors um, doing what. And I think sometimes it's quite helpful to think about accountability in the system as sort of top-down and bottom-up um, accountability. So on the top-down side, you've obviously got the regulator, but you've got commissioners with the provider purchaser split or market shapers in um, markets like childcare and old the care, you've got the professional regulators, and then on the bottom up side, of course, you've got people power, so the power that people have through the choices they make about um, their services, but also, of course, voice, so the power they have through feeding back about services, the extent to which that makes a difference in transforming the services they receive on the ground, but also community accountability, the role of organisations uh, like Healthwatch. And I think too often in the past, the debate's been a bit too easily dichotomised between proponents of the top-down approach to uh, accountability or the bottom-up view of the world. But I guess what I want to argue um, this evening is that actually what's really key in this kind of very messy system, and perhaps I'm a bit less worried about having very, very clear, defined, non-overlapping roles um, than Stephen is, but is that intersection between bottom-up and top-down accountability uh, and, and the importance of, of both to each other. And, you know, just as an illustration at which we're the Consumer Association, people you know, often thinks that means we're about consumer power and that's it. But we recognise the limits to people power in public services, the fact that people often don't feel like they've got the right information to make a decision, or even they don't feel like they have a choice in the first place when they're um, organising a care home for their elderly relative at a point of crisis. And that actually a lot of power in the system is predicated on providers. So if you're talking about voice, and patient voice or user voice, a lot of that power is in the gift of the provider. Do they listen to people? Are they engaging with them? So I just want to make kind of three points, I suppose, about the interrelationship between top-down and bottom-up accountability um, and implications for quality regulation. And first, I think there's this question that David alluded to, which is the question of who gets to judge what quality is. Um, and I think it's much easier to identify what quality is when we're talking about hard clinical outcomes. Um, you know, we know, all know that lower mortality rates are a good thing from a particular procedure, but it's harder to define what quality looks like in terms of more subjective outcomes, like how cared for people feel when they're in hospital or, um, you know, when they're receiving care and the nature of the patient experience. And I think this is a really important distinction and why you need to get the balance right between top down and um, bottom up. And just as an illustration, um, some of our investigators at which we sent out lay researchers um, to go and experience uh, dentistry and optometry consultations and to kind of report back to an expert panel. And what we found is there's no better, obviously, there's no better person to judge the quality of that patient clinician um, interaction than the person themselves. You know, do they get service with a smile as they'd expect? But actually, that our lay researchers weren't particularly good at judging clinically whether their um, consultations did all that they were meant to. And some people came out feeling really positive about consultations, great rapport with the clinician, uh, but actually that clinician had missed out on some really key, key things that they should have looked at. 
So I think on the subjective side, what service users kind of have to say has to form a really important part of judgments um, that regulators are forming. And we all know that regulators of health and care haven't historically been uh, very good at this, but on a positive note, it is a big focus for the CQC at the moment. But I think there are a couple of challenges. First, we know from our work at which that people all, all often feel the, uh, fear the consequences of feeding back honestly about the care they receive, particularly if they're in a vulnerable position, um, uh, you know, and particularly if they're in a small setting uh, uh, like a care home. So that's one challenge for the CQC to think about in how it goes out and really gets the honest views of people. And second, there's a challenge around the amount of time that inspectors have to assess a service in this kind of modern day and age. And I think to Ofsted, for example, you know, I, I'm a vice chair of governors at a primary school, experienced two Ofsted inspections over the last two years. Um, and inspectors come to schools armed with mounds and mounds of data, and they've always got their hypothesis of what's going on in a school before they arrive there. And in many many sort of ways, that's important and that's right, because actually the data on achievement um, in schools is really key to how a school is doing. But it doesn't tell you the whole story of, of what's going on, and Ofsted has to find a way of capturing other types of outcome, and in quite a short space of time. And I think there may be some important lessons for care there. So one um, outcomes framework that had a lot of purchase in the sector um, over the last kind of 10 years is Every Child Matters. And this was an outcomes framework uh, that spanned all children's services. There's a lot you could criticise it for, but in the end, what it functioned as was a common outcomes framework around softer, well, what you might term softer outcomes, um, but outcomes that sit outside hard um, achievement data. And I think there's some important questions there. I also think it's really important for regulators to look at how providers use feedback and complaints as part of their quality standards, um, because, again, we know that that power sits with the provider. Um, Second point is really about the question of risk-based regulation and the role of people's uh, voice in that. And risk-based regulation has traditionally been, been based on hard outcomes data, like achievement data in education, clinical data for health. But I think we really need to think about what is the role of user voice um, in risk-based uh, regulation, partly because hard data often doesn't work in the system, as we saw in mid-staffs. Um, so it can be a critical safety valve, but also because if some of the key outcomes are about patient experience, user voice does need to play a role in risk-based um, uh, regulation. And at which, this is why we've argued for, for example, um, we think it's really important that the CQC is transparent, completely transparent, about how complaints and the complaints that people make about a service um, feed into the process of risk-based uh, regulation. Lastly, I think there's a role um, that regulators play in informing choice. Um, people have obviously now got unprecedented amounts of choice about which services um, they access. Um, and our insight work shows that um, when people are deciding what ca you know, which care home to put their uh, parent in, they do expect an official regulator to be providing a view on the quality of care. And I think that's something that's important. You know, the sort of compliance, non-compliance view of the world, which the CQC used to take in respect of care, um, people don't find that very helpful. That said, they're also healthily sceptical about relying on a single expert um, view alone. As you expect, it's one factor that they'd like to take into account. Um, but it is, it, it is a really important source of information um, to throw into the mix, particularly because our investigations have shown, you know, when we sent actors to live in care homes, there's a big difference between what people are told on a visit to a care home, what people are told in the marketing material, and what people actually experience. And I've just got one more point. Well, if very, quickly. very quickly. Um, so um, the last point I wanted to make was, and throw out there was really about the limits of, of quality regulation. And, you know, as I said, it, it's always really been true, I think, that our public service services have been dissolved, dev uh, devolved. This is a systems point that Stephen uh, was making. The real power lies with providers, whether that's hospital, um, care homes or schools. And you know, for all the talk of people power, a lot of uh, power still lies there. And I think in an increasingly devolved system, even more so now, there's always been a temptation for policymakers and politicians to load things um, on, on regulators uh, to do, because it's an easy way of trying to make you know, schools and hospitals do particular uh, things. 
But I think if you overload um, uh, kind of the job of the inspectorate, um, it really undermines uh, the effectiveness of that regulator to assess the quality of service. So it's, it's a powerful lever to an extent, but if you overuse it, you kind of detract from its uh, usefulness. Um, and finally... No. Uh, Okay, finally, just to say, regulation, um, you know, the other last point I want to make is it's not the silver bullet for public service reform, although I think it's tempting to uh, think of it as such. You know, the heart of every public service reform question is how do we make services better? What do we do about the failing service? So is how do we make the average services look like the outstanding ones? I think regulators have got a really um, important role to play in that, but we have to recognise what's going on in the rest of the, dare I say it, system. And then a good example of that is the care system. It's under intense resource pressure. Councils are going to be under pressure to deliver more state-funded care, but with less resource. And our first reaction when we kind of hear about poor quality care, um, particularly terrible cases of abuse and neglect, is to think about policing the system. Now, of course, that's the right response in some ways, but policing the system You're isn't going to deal with, to with, with right. isn't the solution to everything. <laughs> Great, okay. thank you. Thank you. Thank you for letting me borrow time <laughs> from the other two. <laughs> Right, right. I'm very keen to hear what's said out there. Do you, there's some things for you to respond to there. Do you want to... No, go to the let's, audience. Let's go, go I'm, I'm happy to... Uh, okay, so who would like... Yes, there. Do you do the usual thing of saying who you are and kind of where you come from? And there's some microphones around, just literally behind you. Um, I'm Brendan Martin, public lawyer. It's a social enterprise. Working to improve services by improving staff wellbeing and involvement. Um, I, I, I wanted to refer back to, I think, your very first slide, which set out, I think, your mission statement, which said that your role is to, and I'm quoting, make sure you do various things, including improvement of quality of services. It seems to me, and I think both what Stephen Durrell and Sonia have said express some of this too, that... That's setting the bar for regulation far too high. You simply can't make sure of the things that you say you intend to make sure of. And if you want to build public trust in, reg in regulation, you shouldn't say that you can. And it worries me that you aspire to be a very well-known organisation in that context because I think it may undermine the responsibility of people themselves and of providers and their staff to do what you say you're going to do, which is indeed to make sure that the services meet those aspirational standards. So I will come back on that because yep. I just want to correct what I did say. And what the slide said is we make sure that health and care services provide people. So we don't do it. This was my point. And my words were, we encourage services to improve. That's a straight lift from the legislation that says what our job is. So our job isn't to do improvement. This is my key point about we are not an improvement agency, but we are an agent of improvement. So just to come back to you on that. And it plays to Stephen's point. Just Sorry, no, 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 Nick. Exactly, uh, uh, to, to Stephen's point about... Yeah. You cannot regulate quality into services. Yeah. We're not pretending to do. We don't think you can do it. What we do is we check whether quality is in services. As Robert Francis said, the responsibility for putting quality into services rests with the providers. Can, yeah. can I just yeah. make one point that David can't, which is that he's caught on the horns of a dilemma because he has to carry out his statutory responsibility. And his statutory responsibility is to encourage an improvement of care. Yeah. So the, your point is... Is a, is a confusion in the legislation that David can't then turn around and say, well, I'm not doing that, because you'll find himself in the High Court if he does. Yeah. And, I mean, there is also a sort of interesting point in that, if, you know, once you have... How far, once you have an inspection regulated, do you unintentionally lift the responsibility of the commissioners and providers Absolutely. for being responsible for what they're delivering? Mm. And, I mean, to sort of pick up your point, I mean, I sort of suspect we... We expect too much of inspection and regulation, and actually what we do is remove responsibility by having it almost, which is a, another bloody paradox. This is a point about this five influences on quality, and I think there's been an over-reliance, to come to your points, on, it, on regulation as a way of driving it in, an insufficient weight given to what the other influences are. Yep. Could we get a microphone to the, next to the person who just spoke, and there was a hand up right down here, if we can get the microphone down here afterwards. Thank you. Um, 
Good afternoon. My name's uh, Nick Hardwick. I'm the Chief Inspector of uh, Prisons, which have more in common with hospitals than you might think. Uh, but, but I wanted to make two points. I want to make uh, just two points. I think that uh, critical to my role and David's is the, is the question of uh, independence and accountability. And independent of who and accountable of who are the key questions, I think. And it seems to me if the CQC, like my inspectorate, uh, ultimately, its budget is set by the department that uh, is responsible for the service it regulates and inspects. And if David and his colleagues are appointed by the minister who is responsible for the services that it regulates and inspects, I think that significantly compromises the, your, your and my independence. And I'm interested in your view on that. And I think to test that, see, I, I think you ought to actually, your boss ought to be Stephen Dorrell. That's, I would have you report to a select committee. And a test, I think, of that would be, if you were to suggest that to Jeremy Hunt, would he have a problem with it? My guess is he would, because he would see it as losing influence. He would see it as leaving a tool. And that, I think, is a demonstration about it, uh, the, the independence. The second point, I think, which links to uh, independence, is the panel used the word inspector and regulator interchangeably. I don't think they are interchangeable. So a difference between my inspectorate and yours, David, is... Uh, my role is simply to report on the treatment of prisoners and the conditions in prisons. I have no role in encouraging improvement. If that happens, it's a byproduct. And I can't enforce my recommendations. So I absolutely am clear I'm independent of the system I inspect. So I can give people information, they can decide what to do, with it, but that's not my responsibility. And I think, and it would be tempting to have more powers, uh, in, in some ways very attractive, but it seems to me once you have those powers to be able to close down an institution, to be able to set the standards, then I think that compromises your independence. And again, David, you gave the example of a football game where the referee is independent of the, of the uh, coaches and the players. But can you also say, actually, I don't like these rules. I think these are the wrong rules. The rules I'm going to test you against are these. Uh, and I, I think there is a, a, a conflict between the powers that people think regulators and inspectors should have mm. and their desire that those bodies should be independent. And yeah. I think but, it's but difficult but to The difference is you, you, you're an inspector. I'm an inspector. David's an inspector and regulator. He does market exit and entry. Well, I think, uh, I think, I think people use the terms interchangeably. Yeah, they do. But there's a big difference. There is a big difference. So I'll need to um, use my language with more precision. Uh, I take absolutely that point. But this is what I was trying to say, Nick. I think um, you're, a, a, you're a Her Majesty's Inspector. I'm just a Chief Exec. <laughs> <laughs> and behind that, there's a whole lot of stuff uh, about image, about status, about trust and respect, and all the things that cascade from that. And I make that point quite deliberately. But also what goes with this, I think, is what you are as a legal entity and what we are. And uh, I think Stephen's point uh, about in my defence to Brendan's point earlier was actually we are a construct to the intentions of Parliament at whatever time they're made and there were trends and flavours about who was what. There was a big debate about whether CQC should be uh, in the same status as you are. Uh, you know, Ofsted is a non-departmental government body. Uh, depart uh, no, what is it? Yeah, department. Thank you, Richard. Uh, we're a non-departmental public body. And I think that then defines this issue. But what I was trying to say um, in what uh, the presentation is, I think our accountability takes many different forms across the regulators. I mean, David sat just in front of you. There's a, a slightly different version there. There's a professional regulators in the room. They've got a different version, etc. And I'm not saying anyone's right or anyone is more independent or less independent than the other one. I'm just saying this is where we are and this is the sense we're making of our responsibilities. The money bit is actually quite important because uh, Martin's at the back, Martin Green, and we're on a trajectory of full cost recovery. Um, so we'll get to a point where ultimately the majority of our money is coming from uh, the fees that people pay. This is yeah. Nick's regulator point. We're not an inspector. Yeah. And when we get to that point, our relationship with government becomes very different, it strikes mm. me. That's yeah. right. 
because I'm not beholding them to anything. At the minute, effectively, the transaction that we had with the department was, you want us to do these new hospital inspections. We think they need to be done, but we need the resources to do it. I mean, goodness me, Stephen held my predecessors to account for, have you got enough resource to do it? I think it was one of the first questions when I came into the job that I was asked. And it had got to be a transaction that we said to the department and to the Secretary of State, we can deliver this for you, um, but we need the money. So I thought that was a first transaction. This is my point about the state rather than government. Mm. You know, I, I mean, it's a big debate. Are you an arm of the state? Of course we are. It's an it's a undergraduate essay, is that? And, you know, we are. <laughs> but, um, but on that point, it's interesting that before the Audit Commission became an inspectorate, it, all its money came from the fees it charged. Yeah. It's expected, and it yeah. top slice those to do its yeah. national studies. And people, I remember people saying to me in the early days, well, this is a crucial part of our independence because we're not actually answerable to ministers in that sense. We, you know, we, and There's another point as well, which is that by drawing from fees from the, the, uh, the care providers, you are then blind as to the precise ownership structure and all of those issues about who the care provider is. Uh, what we don't want to be in the position of is the taxpayer funding a, a regulator uh, that is, uh, which compromises its independence and also compromises its ability to look across the best answer mm. to the patient's problem. Mm. And I mean, this answer of, yeah, who, of no, accountability to Parliament is interesting because your know, National Audit Office is accountable to Parliament, and okay, it's not a regulator, it's not an inspector, but it, it, it does talk a lot about bounty for money and a performance of government. And the fact that it reports to Parliament has always struck me as one of its great strengths. Well, do you think there's a, uh, think there's a realistic model where, health, where ministers would ever say, OK, let, let, you know, we'll have them report to Parliament because that is more independent than reporting to us? It's something we consciously developed. Uh, uh, we were in a bit the same position as David with his encouraging uh, quality. Uh, a select committee can't rewrite the legislation. Mm -hmm. Uh, but what we can do is, is uh, s uh, set up a direction of travel, uh, and it's the old truth, isn't it, that nobody ever gave anybody power. Mm -hmm. uh, power is there for people who go and take it and demonstrate what they can do with it. And within the select committee uh, system, within the health select committee, in particular with the professional regulators, with the agreement, I have to say, of the GMC, uh, we took the view uh, that engaging in public accountability, engaging in public with the, what's now the PSA, so that we were in turn taking the PSA reports on the professional regulators into account as a kind of informal uh, NAO kind, kind of relationship between the, N the, the PSA and the Health Committee, what we were beginning to do was develop something which is way outside any House of Commons standing order, but which is the principle that the professional regulators have an accountability to Parliament separate from their accountability to ministers. And being on, sat in the audience answering the questions, it feels like I'm accountable to Parliament. Yep. I do not feel like I'm going through some choreographed game. Because, you know, I went to the bakers the Saturday after the last time I'd been, and I went in the bakers and we said, we saw you on telly. And they were A-level students that had watched the Parliament channel. We happened to get that select committee, and that's what they were doing for the Constitution. And, you know, the number of people that have come to me saying, we watched you on TV, and what they meant is not Newsnight. They actually meant the Parliament channel. Were that. So I think we misunderstand that accountability. I'm deadly serious about that. But the key issue in terms of the independence is we must be independent in our judgments. So I think the Secretary of State would like more hospitals out of special measures. Well, he won't get it because they're not ready to come out. And we would fail the people of those communities that those hospitals are delivering care to. It is the being on the side. So it's a dead easy discussion for us to have had internally and then justify externally that actually some of these places are just not good enough. And, and Martin knows we'll do that on care homes where we say this isn't good enough. Whatever people would want us to do because I think we'd fail our accountability to people. I want to take some more comments from that. Just the point, the Select Committee has added a layer, of, you know, by adding a layer of accountability, which is a public form of accountability. It's not quite the same as saying, should you cut the umbilical cord to ministers and actually be answerable to Parliament. There were some hands up at the back there. I don't know whether they still are. Yes, I know. I was, I was just wondering if you get the microphones to those hands, and we'll take this one over here and then come back to those two. Uh, Rob Whiteman, Chief Executive of SIP for uh, the Accountancy Body. Two very brief points. That you all alluded to the trade-off that can occur between 
innovation and minimum standards. Um, commissioning or regulation doesn't create innovation. Innovation happens at the front line. And so I guess a question for you, David, is the more that your framework operates correctly, the more you probably then need to scrap it because people will game the system and there will just be one view of what good looks like. So how do you build some form of dynamism into your model? Because over the years, having seen many inspection and regulatory regimes across the public sector, there can come a point where the inspector or the regulator has a very set view of what good can look like and it can stifle uh, innovation. And yeah. how can you be alive to that at the beginning? And then the second point is, um, over the next, over the last few parliaments, health spending went from 5% of GDP to 8% of GDP and is probably going to fall back to about 6% of GDP over the next couple of parliaments, whilst local authorities are losing about 30% of their government grant. Uh, is there a role for regulators to speak truth unto power and say whether the resource envelope, which is being given to public services, is correct. Certainly the NAO would do that in relation to Parliament, but for people in public services, there's sometimes a suspicion that regulators always say that service problems are the result of poor management rather than perhaps the government isn't quite giving them the deal that they need on resource allocation. Do you want to part those two for a couple of minutes and take a couple more questions back there? Yeah, together. I've actually got the microphone. Yep, right. Um, <laughs> 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 I'm uh, Paul Twyman. I am here as a customer, I suppose, but in a previous incarnation I was director of the deregulation unit. I'd like to hear more from David about outliers and what he means by them and how he uses them. And why I'm interested in what I think are outliers, which are interesting, odd little things which point towards bigger things that virtually every regulator that I've looked at and had experience of are hopeless of picking up these small things. And every one of the disasters that Nicholas referred to in his introduction was actually brought to the attention of different authorities and I sense that nothing much had ever taken place. And listening to your accent, you come from the Northwest. Now, why is it? Rochdale paedophiles were rattling around for decades with plenty of people talking about them, but no one seems to have done anything about it. Now we're going to wait for inquiries, maybe, but I wonder whether you've got any views as to what makes a good regulator or inspector in terms of picking up on these small items of evidence which then point you towards bigger problems. Can we take one more just in the front? Sorry, there's a hand right at the... the can you... You had your hand up for ages. Sorry. Hi, uh, my name's Ruth. I work for Health Education England. Um, I would, as a, as a taxpayer, I'd like to see um, the conversation about quality of care set in the context of overall value for money um, because people receiving the care are not the only people involved. Um, there are also many taxpayers who never receive any care. Um, that's it. Uh, can we take one more down there and then we'll group those and stuff together? Um, again, another consumer, actually, probably nearer the end than most people here. Can I say what concerns me is that regulations can only inform based on evidence. And only Sonia referred to actually the grassroots level of collecting evidence. And what really concerns me is that once you get to regulators and you discuss whether they're this or they're that and government comes in it's the regulations themselves that become the issue and that is actually what's causing the problem what concerns me is how do you ascertain you get that information and it is respected for instance if mistreatment is occurring to mental health patients or dementia patients if somebody, does anybody go and collect that evidence from them? Is there somebody to listen? Because it's terribly easy for other people to refute it mm. on the grounds of their medical condition. Mm. And this, to me, is becoming the problem. Yep. Thank you. All right. 
Shall I go first? Yes, if you'd like to pick something. Because yeah. I think, if I may say so, uh, your, the last point is uh, precisely right, uh, and it is what uh, the, the regulators in the system uh, ought to be, for, uh, my own mistake, but what regulators ought to be focusing on. Um, and it's, it come, it's the point here as well. Uh, should the regulator be commenting on the level of public spending committed to these services? Uh, I'm not particularly, I'm not sensitive about that, but that doesn't seem to me to be the point. The point is, what does it mean if you're a patient with a particular clinical condition, what is the experience of that patient on that day in that care provider? And it's information about that that is at the heart of, what the, 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 of the service that the regulator uh, can perform. Uh, because that's what provides the opportunity to enforce safety standards below which nobody should, be, uh, should go. It's also the opportunity, it's also what allows the commissioner to test what's going on there against what's going on elsewhere, again, on evidence provided by the regulator in order to drive improvement through the system, which is the answer to your first question. Uh, David's talked about defining what good looks like. You were confusing, if I may say so, good with orthodox. Uh, the regulators develop an orthodoxy, and then, yes, they're dangerous. Good regulators, particularly if they're not entrapped in the system and looking outside uh, England, outside the UK, testing the experience of the individual with a set of conditions against the experience of other individuals with the same conditions elsewhere in England, but also elsewhere in the world, looking at what can be done. That's what tests and, and, and challenges those who are responsible for making the value, answering the value questions, because you're right that the... the uh, People who make spending decisions, the commissioners in this case, are accountable for the standards they deliver for the money they spend. It's value for money. And you have to look at both sides of the equation when you're testing that. That's a commissioner function, not a regulator function. Uh, and it's, it, it, it's not only is it a question of the patient relationship with the taxpayer, the value received by the patient for the money spent by the taxpayer, it's also, you need always to remember, the patient outside the consulting room. Is the money being used to deliver a service to this patient fair as compared with the opportunity for spending the same money on a different patient and delivering a greater health outcome? And that's where, of course, NICE and all the questions of, uh, of, uh, of qualities and that debate comes in. Yep. Sonia. Um, yeah, the, I guess the point that I wanted to make was just that I don't think we should underestimate what a massive step forward it will be if the new CQC system of inspection, uh, of regulation rather, <laughs> regulatory visits um, works. What a step forward that will be in terms of the evidence, particularly in relation to the quality of care in care homes and home care. I think the scariest thing about the system at the moment is actually we don't have system-wide evidence on the quality of care that's being delivered and that is something that the CQC through its new um, inspection regime could deliver, deliver, start to deliver that kind of information. I think on the resource envelope point, for me it's not the job of the regulator to make overall comments on the resource envelope, but at the moment actually we don't know what our baseline is on quality of care, we don't know what's going to happen to it over the next five years. It's really important we start measuring these things and that's the role of the CQC. It's the role of other people I think to come to conclusions about what is and is not deliverable within a particular resource envelope. So I've been in about five different discussions this week about this issue about money, value, Im added value, etc. And um, the discussions have ranged from CQC should be well out of it. And Stephen's made an additional point about it's a commissioning job. Um, there's the argument that if we're assessing the money that's in the system, we'll compromise our judgments about quality to make it fit with the money. So there's a purist argument about an economic regulator, which is some of what David's been doing and what we do as a quality regulator. And that was what I was reaching for in saying we need to work alongside our colleagues. And you know, I think we do that with David, who will tell you differently if um, it was different. I think the biggest thing, though, um, 
that we're finding, and I made this in the presentation, is about variation. I'm still troubled mm. by why there's some people with a set amount of money can deliver quite outstanding services, Absolutely. to be honest. And there are others with the same yeah. amount of money that are delivering services which are just poor. Totally right. There's, uh, pardon my North West accent, I'll come back to that in a minute. Um, it's a flat vowels. Um, I always refuse the execution. <laughs> but um, there's a deadly serious point there about variation. Um, you never know whether you're going to speak truth to power, Rob, until you're there in front of somebody and they say, I want you to do this, and you say, I'm not sure that's a thing to do. And uh, I've had one or two moments. Fortunately, they've never been in a job that has been as public as the one that I'm doing now, where you know, within a nanosecond of doing it, somebody will be tweeting it and giving me a mark out of 10. But that will ultimately be the judgment. Uh, as I've tried to pull down this um, example of where I think there is a an expectation that you can't criticise the NHS um, because if you do, you're against it somehow rather than actually, unless we have an honest conversation about quality, there's not going to be a platform for improvement. And this is my point about what is the responsibility people need to respond to our judgments as opposed to challenging our judgments. Let us worry about getting the right system in place, uh, the right judgments in place, improving the quality of that. But what we're going to do is actually call it as we see it. And you can have a row about our methodology and where the decimal points are and whether that's a, um, a, a statistically significant difference. So you could actually just say, actually, it's, it's you know, 48% of people were satisfied with the service just isn't good enough. Mm -hmm. If you've got a survey that says it's 62, well, fine. Yeah. Yeah. I will we'll write 62 in the report. It still isn't good enough. So I think there is a bit about yeah. focus on what's important and not. Uh, game the system. On outliers, um, I'm sorry I can't make the connection with uh, paedophilia in Rochdale, but um, the programme that we've got that we run is on mortality outliers and we use data and we monitor uh, mortality returns from all trusts and if we think we're getting a return where it's an outlier, it's a higher level of mortality for a hospital or a trust or a given level of proceedings, then we ask a question. Why is this? And depending on the answer, we might respond by accepting that or by deciding we actually need to look more carefully and more closely at what is driving mm -hmm. that. As I said in the presentation, we look at using intelligent monitoring to look at patterns and trends and outliers. Um, so one of the things that we've been doing is growing our capability to assess the intelligence, the data that exists, this is the hard quantitative data, and the softer qualitative data, and we've built an approach called intelligent monitoring, which is literally about identifying where there are questions to be asked, because we think if those patterns continue, it's a signal that there's going to be risk in that service, and we need to either ask some questions or go and have a good look. And on the intelligent monitoring, we think there are about 70 indicators around acute trusts, broadly 70 are clinical indicators, and then there's about 70 qualitative indicators which we look at. And... Um, First time we published it, we published three lots of this data. First time we published it, the journalists insisted on putting it in a league table. Uh, we published it last week, and I don't think it made a single national newspaper. And I don't know whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, but we're using that, coming back to risk-based inspection, to assess risk and target where we inspect, what we inspect, and why, based on that data. It's a, it's a smoke alarm. It's not definitive. It's a small alarm. The criticism we got on mid-staffs, and this plays to, I think, your point about softer information, was um, actually the patients in mid-staffs have been complaining for six years before the Healthcare Commission went in. So the question we got when I came into post is, can you predict that there'll be another mid-staffs? And the answer to that is, with difficulty, but we do think there's some data that can lead you to predict it. You can't predict it with precision. I didn't take my raincoat out yesterday, I got wet. You couldn't predict it with precision. Um, but we think there's more work that we can do, and that's what we've been doing. Uh, and therefore, you'll see our inspection programme, which is driven by that intelligent monitoring, 
and we've changed the order we've inspected. In fact, there have been some places we've gone in with very, very little notice at all because we've been concerned about what the intelligent monitoring tells us. I can tell you where those places are if that would help, but actually what we've used it to target our resource when we go, what we look at, what the key lines of inquiry are. So I think we've done more on, in relation to that. Um, we won't get in the way of innovation, and I think the way we'll do that is by constantly being open to that challenge of going to block <coughs> innovation. The other way is to speak to people who are using services about what they think is important. Because if they want services that are important, they'll let us know. And if we ever cut off that line of intelligence back to us, we'll get in a dangerous place. And um, I'm sorry, I think we do do this on the evidence. We've put an awful lot of emphasis on listening to complainants. So in all of our hospital inspections, we have... Um, we look at the complaints, we look at the whistleblowers, we have forum for people using services, we have forum for junior staff and senior staff. There's a lot of evidence now on the correlation between staff that are engaged in their service and the quality of that service. And the great thing about acute hospitals, if you ask a junior doctor what it's like to be a junior doctor around here, they tell you without fear of favour because their loyalty is to the career, not to the institution. And the correlation between what the junior doctor survey and quality is quite remarkable. And that plays to the intelligent monitoring. That's one of the qualitative indicators we look at, as well as complaints rates. And it's not high, good, low, bad. We just want to know what you're doing with complaints. And the key question is not do you have complaints, but what do you learn from them and what are you doing differently as a result of it? It's that second question that's critical, not how many have you got. Right. We're kind of at the end of time. Is anyone burning to ask a question? in? Which, yes, you had your hand up earlier, so take one, we'll take one more and then we'll try and draw this together. <laughs> uh, Mick Armstrong, I'm um, British Dental Association. Um, David quite rightly said that um, a regulator should have the confidence of um, uh, the people that use the service. Um, he also hinted that they should have the confidence of the people they regulate. When that trust and confidence completely disappears, I'm still unsure who that regulator is accountable to. Yeah. Well, I mean, one of the things that's clear, you know, one of the things you yourself have said, and has sort of become even clearer as you talk about it, is that there are multiple accountabilities. Mm. And ever since we stopped, ever since we moved to a purchase of provider split, we've ended up with multiple accountability for quality. And in some ways it's got more complex rather than less mm. complex. In fact, it's definitely got more complex over the years, less complex. I mean, there's that great story of Dick Crossman when he became Secretary of State of Health and went out and went to Free and Barnet and came back to the office and said, my God, I am responsible for the most awful sort of Victorian lunatic, lunatic bin. And the most important words in that is, I am responsible. Mm. Mm. And as soon as you move to purchase a provider split, you fragment that. So the Secretary of State is still responsible, but we end up with commissioners who are responsible and regulators doing all sorts of bits of regulation. And so kind of a loss of, there's a loss of accountability because there are so many more bodies involved. Is there a resolution towards any of that? Go on. In, in 30 seconds, but uh, there is a, uh, it's two slightly different questions. Uh, the question, uh, who, is, who is David and the CQC uh, mm. responsible uh, yeah. to, who is it accountable to? Uh, I suppose the fact of the matter is that the previous regime in the CQC resigned after a Health Select Committee hearing, uh, and David and uh, the two Davids were appointed by the, uh, mm. correct me if I'm wrong, but by ministers. Uh, and no, I wasn't, but David was. David, yeah. David, yeah. Pryor, David yeah. Pryor was, a, was appointed by ministers subject to a, a, a health committee hearing advice, but it was a definitely a decision by ministers. You were presumably appointed by the commission sure. itself. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so th that's, uh, that's, if you like, an mm. illustration of the principle that Nick offers, that, these are, uh, uh, th that there isn't absolute clarity. I actually don't think it matters that there's more than one accountability chain. We're talking about 10% of everything that goes on in the UK economy. It's not surprising that it's moderately complicated. Uh, and, and if there is an organisation which has clear responsibility for identifying standards and reporting on them in public, 
the CQC, that seems to me to be a clear definition of responsibility for which it's reasonable to hold the CQC to account. If there's another organisation that is responsible for spending £120 billion of public money in order to secure health outcomes, NHS England, it doesn't seem to me unreasonable to expect that organisation, through its devolved responsibilities, to be accountable for the money that's used and the health outcome that's achieved. So defining accountability doesn't mean 10% of the UK economy is all one person's responsibility and when somebody drops the famous bedpan in Tredigo, we hear about it in Whitehall. That's nonsense. What it means is that people have clear, defined accountabilities and they're held to account for the way that they discharge them. Um, I guess I, ju I just wanted to return to this point about regulation stifling innovation because I think it's a really important one. I think there is something quite serious there, but I also don't think we should overplay its importance because I just don't buy this idea that there's like a whole cadre of NHS leaders out there who are amazing innovators, but their hands are just tied by those CQC um, regulators who are going to come around knocking on their door. I think we already have examples of outstanding practice. They flourish in the system as it exists. And if you look at the nature of leadership that creates those, um, it's not that there's lots of barriers out there and they just can't do what they really want to do. They find ways to work with the system. Um, and a businessman once said to me, a very successful businessman, regulation is what, what people who fail use as an excuse for their failure. So I think we just need to be careful about, what, you know, there is an important point, regulation can stifle innovation, but I, I absolutely don't think it's the main barrier to innovation in the NHS. Yeah. David, would you like a last word? I agree. Well, I, I think um, our argument really this afternoon has been that um, regulation... Um, for regulation to drive improvements in quality in health and care, we need to be independent, accountable and trusted. I think that's what people want, which is where I'd come back. I just accept I've got multiple accountabilities, but what do we think we're doing here is I think we're providing assurance for people who are using health and care services. So they need to trust us, they need to respect our independence, that we're not speaking as an apologist for anybody else. And I expect to be held accountable for the way that we do that. By, by you as a dentist, by Stephen as a politician, by the Secretary of State who's been elected. Nobody's put a cross in a box next to my name. Somebody asked me to do a job. I take that responsibility seriously. But actually we've got a democracy which says you get to make some decisions when you've got enough crosses next to your name and you're in a party that forms a government. I'm okay with that personally. Um, and uh, I respect... Stephen's right to hold me to account as a chair of a committee, the Secretary of State's right to hold me to account for what I do, whatever the political complexion of the government at the time. But actually, I think I'm doing it for us as consumers, not to keep the politicians happy. And I think if they're doing their job properly, as representatives of the people, they're going to hold me to account for how I meet the needs of people. And that, I think, is a transaction that we're uh, uh, undertaking. But in order to do that, I've seen my job as to restore political, professional and public confidence in CQC. Because if we don't have that confidence, that trust, we're not going to do our job. And in order to do that, we need to be independent of our judgments amidst that multiple mm -hmm. accountabilities that we've got. And I think that's the argument we're trying to prosecute today mm -hmm. and trying to give some oxygen to that debate about how we take that forward. I want to legitimise the debate about our accountability, our independence uh, yeah. through doing that, rather than pretend it's not an issue. It is an issue and we need to get hold of it. Yeah. That's fantastic. And there are some clearly issues around accountability. I'm, I'm always intrigued by the accountable to ministers for a public service, accountable to parliament, which is not something you can do anything about, but it uh, seems to me that that's an issue worth a longer term debate, I think. Um, in case you haven't picked one of these up, free advertising plan. There is this pamphlet that gets us all through. Can I just say thank you very much to all of you for coming. It's been great contributions and there's been a lot of meat and a lot to think about. And thank you very much to our panel and would you like to thank them and yourselves.